Korean story. I knew I'm making it the time. I wonder if that really means. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's never, never time. It's in Russian. It's in Russian. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. There we go. It takes our time. I'm wondering. Yeah. Flynn? Oh, so we're on the air. Okay. okay. So, so good morning. Uh, and welcome to the January 14th, 2020 Historic Site Preservation Board monthly meeting. May we have a roll call, please? Yes, good morning, Mr. Chair and board members. Member Rosenau? Here. Member Nelson? Present. Member Kaiser? Here. Member Dixon? Present. Member Huff? Here. Chair Burkett? Here. You have a quorum. Thank you. May we have a report on the posting of the agenda, please? Yes, the agenda for this meeting was posted in pub for public review at the City Hall Bulletin Board on the west side of the Council Chamber and in the Planning Department counter at 6 p.m. on Thursday, January 9th in accordance with state law. Thank you. Does the Board have any revisions to the agenda? I would like to make, seeing none, I would then like to make a motion to accept the agenda as amended. Second. So, I, <clears throat> so there was a first by, uh, a motion by Burkett and a second by... Uh, uh, Member Huff, any further discussion? All in favor, please uh, say aye. aye. Any opposed? The motion carries six to zero. So, time for public comment. This time has been set aside for members of the public to address the Historic Site Preservation Board on agenda items and items of general interest within the subject matter jurisdiction of the board. Although the Historic Site Preservation Board values your comments, pursuant to the Brown Act, it generally cannot take any action on items not listed on the posted agenda. There will be three minutes assigned for each speaker. Testimony for public hearings will be taken at the time of the hearing. Do we have anyone wishing to address the board today on non-public hearing items? Seeing none, no speakers, we will move on to the consent calendar. Item 1A, <coughs> approval of the minutes, December 10th, 2019 HSPB meeting. Does anyone have any changes to the December 10th minutes? Seeing none, may I have a motion to accept the minutes as presented? So moved. Second. So we have a First by Member Kaiser and a second by Member Dixon. Any further discussion? All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries six to zero. So we'll move now on to public hearings. Item 2A is an application by Daniel Krog and Adam Bonet, members for Class 1 excuse me, owners for Class 1 Historic Resource Designation of the Shea Residence located at 1690 Ridgemore Drive. May I have a staff report, please? Yes, good morning, Mr. Chair and Board. This is an application brought forward by the property owner. The property is a single-family residence at the uh, southerly end of Ridgemore Drive, roughly 4,200 square foot in size, the design of which has been credited to local architect John Walling, constructed in 1976 for John and Marion Shea. In review of your staff report, the analysis uh, against the criteria uh, is beginning on uh, page three. In this particular case, the uh, application asserts that the uh, Shea residents, and you know I have a challenge here moving through my report and doing these slides together. This is an aerial view of the uh, Shea residence at the end of Ridgemore Drive. Uh, the uh, residence exemplifies the late modern period in architecture, the 70s, and it was an area similar to the early part of the modernist movement when it was a minimal use of ornament, use of new materials, and exposed expression of the structure. The Shea residence, as I noted in your staff report, differs, though, however, from the more modestly scaled uh, versions of uh, buildings that you saw in the 50s and 60s. There's a larger scale. There's a feeling of luxury and a more exuberant use of materials. The Shea residence utilizes the post and beam structural system found in many of the earlier mid-century modern homes. However, it too takes on an exaggerated scale 
using the glue lamp post and beams in contrast to the dimensional 4x4 lumber that you would see on the earlier homes from the 50s and 60s. Uh, the larger scale uh, also results in interior volumes that distinguish the Say residence from earlier examples of modern architecture, making it a noteworthy example of the late modern architectural period. If I move this down here, we'll get our criteria up. So it reflects the post-World War II period and the late modern period in architecture. As noted on um, uh, page uh, four of your staff report, there's discussion regarding the distinctive method of construction. It's considered very unique in a residential application for the use of the tilt-up method of construction, in which concrete panels are poured in place on the site and then lifted up into their vertical position uh, to form the walls of the structure. As noted in your staff report, this was a construction technology that was first brought into the United States in around 1905 uh, with the patented system by a gentleman named Robert Aiken, and its first use in residential construction came in 1922 with the construction of the Rudolph M. Schindler House in West Hollywood. The Shea residence, as noted in your staff report, utilizes 42 of these tilt-up reinforced concrete panels in differing sizes. And for those of you that did make it to the site tour, the texture on these panels is really quite extraordinary. Uh, it's, uh, it's much different than what you'd see in the board form concrete that you've often seen in things like the Wellwood Murray Library or even poured in place concrete like you see at the Desert Museum. Uh, this concrete has a, is highly textured and uh, very, very much uh, relates to the site in which it's located. Um, there was an addition done on the Shea residence uh, in the 1980s by architect Albert Frey. This addition was a, two, a second story that was put over the guest wing, adding a couple of more bedrooms, um, and at the time, a uh, exercise room for Mr. Shea. Uh, and as you notice, that is also done in the post and beam style. However, the concrete tilt-up panels don't apply to that second story for weight reasons. And then lastly, on the bottom of page four and onto the top of page five, it's recognizing that the home, although John Walling as an architect does not have much actually written about him, the report asserts that the Shea residence exhibits high artistic value, recognizing the manner in which Walling used an ordinary material, that is the concrete, that would normally be used in um, large warehouse type of projects uh, in a home and brought together a scale and an order to the home using these large glue lamp posts and beams and the uh, concrete panels. The report quotes, and I'm taking in my uh, quotation here on the top of page five of the staff report, uh, from an Architectural Digest article in 1981 that noted that the pattern of interlocking cubes reminiscent of Rietveld, Mondrian, and De Steel could be seen in the home. So the report asserts that the home meets the criteria five as having high artistic value. Continuing on your staff report, five, pages five and six, uh, is an analysis of the integrity of the home, and staff believes that the home does have a very high level of integrity. Uh, most of the materials are still very much in their original condition. On the bottom of page six and the top of page seven is the discussion of the recommended listing of the character-defining features of the home. The uh, report and staff have both asserted that the non-contributing features would be the landscaping and the mechanical equipment and its enclosure, which were uh, more recent installations. So that concludes my staff report. Uh, the applicant is in the audience, and I also, by the way, before I turn it over, um, I wanted to share with you, for those of you that have heard these terms of tilt-up, these are two um, exhibits that I found on the Internet to try to help illustrate this. So you'll see the diagram on the left, I'm, yeah, I'm sorry, on the right, uh, in which these panels are actually laid and cast in place on the ground. And then in figure two, they're actually brought with a crane and hooks set into position, they're stabilized with the supports you see in position three, and then the concrete is poured to actually uh, stabilize them into the footing. And the image on the uh, left is uh, a typical, uh, more of a warehouse type of application, but it illustrates the um, sort of the massive undertaking that's involved with uh, using this particular type of construction, and thus why it makes it unique for this particular home. I think that's the end of my slides. These are some images that help you understand um, how absolutely beautiful these uh, concrete textured panels are. Mm -hmm. And in the picture on the right, you can see how the home and almost each of the rooms, the windows open up at the corners. 
and really bring the outside environment and the terraces around the home as an integral part of the interior of the home. It's also um, strengthened in that regard with the uh, use of the floor stone, which is a flagstone that's carried both inside and outside the home. So I believe that concludes my exhibit here. And that concludes my staff report. The author of the Historic Resources Report, Melissa Ritchie, is in the audience if you have questions, and I'm available to answer any questions you may have. Okay, first, board. Are there any questions of staff? Uh, I have one. The, um, it says the front and rear yard landscaping is a non-contributing feature. And we saw those two beautiful old Melaleuca trees that were probably there from the beginning. Would that help contribute to the landscaping? If the board wanted to include those as part of the character-defining features of the home, you could consider that. There was and also, if you remember, there was a ficus tree that was still left over that was part of the original plantings um, near the corner of the swimming pool that the current owner thought might also have been from the original period. So if that was brought into the motion, does that mean that should these current owners decide to sell and someone buys the property, that those trees are protected? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. I have um, one uh, question of staff. It's really more like a comment. On the non-contributing features, when um, number two, mechanical equipment, should not maybe the word enclosure be added to that? We can do that. Okay, good. Thank you. Any other questions uh, of staff board? Um, I, may I ask a question just a moment of um, Member Dixon? Would you help me with the spelling? Is it M Melaleuca tree? Melaleuca. Would you spell it for me so I can? Thank you, Melaleuca. Sure I will confirm it, but, I, but thank you for giving me at least the start. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. Turn it over to you. All right, if there's no other further questions of staff, I'm going to open the public hearing. Uh, I believe the applicant is present. If the applicant would please come forward, sign in, come to the table, and speak into the mic. Um, please state your name, address, and tell us about your project. You will have 10 minutes to present and two minutes for rebuttal, if desired, after any public comments. I had no idea this was going to happen, so this is awesome. Okay, great. So I'm I'm just signing it here. Yeah. Um. So do you want me to just present about the project, about what I did to it, and right? So we we had always wanted to, to own a historic property in Palm Springs, and. I had done some restoration work on some previous homes here, and we first saw this house online. It was a pocket listing, and we thought it was pretty. We didn't think much of it in then pictures. I mean, it was cool looking, but it wasn't until we got to the site and we saw the aggregate concrete and we saw the, the site itself that really um, excited me. I, I was also excited by the late modernist period. I feel like it's a it's sort of the last sort of hurrah of modernism and I feel like it's underserved in history and in attention and I was excited to restore a late modern home and I just felt like this house was right for that and um, I mean I, I feel like this is a little repetitive because everybody at the site visit I told I told you guys so much when you were there but um, I, I I knew that I wanted to um, <coughs> I mean, the outside speaks for itself, so I really didn't do much to the exterior, except some, you know, little restorations here and there. Uh, and then the interior, um, as I showed the board in the last few days, you know, the kitchens and baths were all remodeled in the in the 90s, and you know, not not to the homes period at all. So uh, I did that, and the landscaping needed to be reconfigured so that it looked like the site, and um, you know, and then the rest was just interior design from there. But um, 
I, I did add quite a lot of the, the rock, the, the natural flagstone that was in the home. I extended that in many places to give it a more um, single surface feeling. And I extended it out through walls of glass again to kind of bring the outdoors in. And uh, I just wanted to make the most of the house. And I mean, my, my motto whenever I do a house, and I sound like I do this, you know, like all the time. I mean, this really probably is the house we'll, we'll stay in forever. But um, whenever I do a house, I always say that I listen to the house first and then I, I listen to myself. And that's kind of was definitely my motto with this house was I just went in and right away I could hear what the house wanted to be. And when I sent the final photos to the previous owner, the person we bought it from, he gave me a really nice compliment. He said, what he liked about what I did was what I didn't do. And that meant a lot to me. And um, I also had a, another friend who's a designer come through and tell me that he couldn't tell what was new and what wasn't new. And that also got me really excited as a preservationist. So, so that's pretty much my, my uh, presentation this morning. <laughs> Well, I want to thank you for the nomination and mm -hmm. your level of detail um, really shows beautifully and uh, make you, uh, your profession proud. Mm -hmm. uh, that's for certain. Be beautiful detail work. Thank you. Uh, on it. If, okay. Uh, thank you so much. We really, really appreciate it. Okay, so great. Thanks a lot, coming. guys. Thank you. So is there anyone else wishing to speak um, on this public hearing item today? Seeing none, I will close the public hearing. So the action is now with the board. Your comments and questions, please. Any questions, any comments? Yes, Mr. Nelson. No questions, really, just uh, a further comment to Dan for his amazing work, but also to acknowledge the previous two owners who helped bring it to this point, because as we know from the historic nomination and the original photo. It was quite different in the interior and had lots of non-native landscape. And um, two owners prior removed a lot of that non-native landscape and made it more appropriate for the setting in which it is uh, there in Andreas Hill with the desert landscape. So I think all three of them should get some uh, recognition from this board uh, and especially Dan. So thank you. Thank you. Yes. Mr. Resnow. No question. Just a couple comments that I was really a treat to go visit yesterday. Um, I'm not f as familiar with the Andreas Hills, and I was not aware of this house at all. Uh, and uh, so it was a very a treat to read the nomination, a treat to visit. I really was blown away by what I saw yesterday. And, um, and I think that the, late, you know, the 70s late modern is now finally getting some great recognition here, and this is a stellar example. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Member Kaiser. This is an example that when you walk into a house and it's just sort of magic. Not only the landscaping as you approach, but you know, the essence of the house is so beautiful. And seeing the aggregate concrete walls against the mountains, which are almost like a more refined version of the mountain. And then seeing the interior and all, <clears throat> all the flagstone and everything, the whole package. I mean, it's wonderful to have this in Palm Springs. And I, Thank you, Dan. It's a magical job. Thank you. Member Dixon. Dan, you really impressed me with your work, but I have to tell you what impressed me the most was saving that tarantula. <laughs> <laughs> you do good work all the way around. <laughs> yes, member of. Okay. Um, I agree with uh, everyone's comments. And I just wanted to add that it's um, great to have um, uh, a home, a residential home that's in that same uh, late modern era, uh, like the Palm Springs Art Museum, you know, with their port in place exposed concrete. Uh, so it's really great to see a private residence uh, use um, those elements with the post and beam and all that. It's, uh, it was, it's excellent, and thank you so much. Yes, and I think another thing that um, has heightened the um, final attention back to late mo uh, modern is the um, Captor Plaza, I think is another I example. And, you know, because it had been, I remember when I first started on the board, you talked about the 70s, you were thinking like that was a very weird time. Um, 
Well, there was some weirdness in it, but not in necessarily in the architecture. And um, so I think it's, it is great that we're embracing more and more uh, of our diversity of architecture here in, in the valley. We're kind of known for us like one particular era, but um, reaching out, I think, becomes very, very important. So, uh, board, any other? Oh. Um, Member okay. Chair, one thing I want to mention, and it was not really um, clear to me when I wrote the staff report, but I think in whatever action you decide to take today, if you decide to make a recommendation on class one designation, I think it would be important that uh, we receive from the applicant uh, some type of a site diagram that indicates those areas where the flagstone has been added. Because I think it's important to understand that which has been added from that which is original. And while the current uh, approach on this particular house was to replicate rather than put something down that's in contrast, uh, it's particularly because we're replicating original materials that I think it's important for the archival file to list those areas of those outside, outside terraces that had received new stone under this particular owner's um, renovation. Okay, thank you. So noted. <clears throat> Any other further questions? Okay. Uh, seeing none, may I have a motion, please? I'll make a motion uh, to uh, recommend that the City Council uh, designate the Shea residence as a Class 1 historic resource. I'll second the motion Good. with some additions. May I just add a friendly um, amendment also that you are accepting the findings in the staff report? Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, I want you to be making the findings as you make these nominations yes. and recommendations. Yes. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay. The motion is subject to the conditions in the report right. that we request a site diagram where the flagstone was added and that we include the ficus and the melaleuca trees as part of uh, con con contributing features of the property. Okay, so we have a m motion that's been um, with an amendment. Is this accepted by the second? The first. The first? Mm -hmm. Oh, me the first, right, excuse me. Um, so any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries six to zero. Congratulations. Thank you. There we go. Okay, so we'll move tonight on to um, item three, unfinished business, which we have done. So we will then go down to new business. Item 4A, um, Glenn and Judith Hudgens, owners requesting approval for alteration of the landscape, the hardscape, and perimeter garden walls at the Hugh Stevens residence, Class 1 historic site, located at 645 East Morongo Road. May I have a staff report, please? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. This is an application that's being brought forward by the owner of the Hugh Stevens residence to do improvements in both the landscape, hardscape, and in the installation of perimeter garden walls. <coughs> As noted in your staff report, when you go to page two and page three, you have somewhat of a chronology of history of what's been uh, done with this home. Uh, you may recall uh, a year or two ago, the homeowner was here uh, requesting approval for an alteration to add a accessory dwelling unit, which was uh, actually something that had been seen on the original um, uh, Clark and Frey plan uh, that's shown in the bottom of uh, page three of your staff report. The upper photo in that particular page, you can see the outline to the upper uh, left where that uh, casita is in the process of being constructed. On page four of your staff report is a comparison of the original site plan to that which is being proposed by the applicant. And on page um, five is the beginning of the uh, description of uh, staff's analysis of the work that they're doing. When we looked at this particular project and the proposed alterations, we see them as being complementary to and harmonious with those that were on the original site plan. Certainly while the original site plan is much simpler in its detail than what we're seeing in the current plan, since it does not include any of the landscape palette, uh, the current plan 
uh, in terms of its use of hardscape, softscape, and um, overall orientation as one enters the house is um, respectful of the original site plan that was designed for this project. I'll note uh, there was an area at the front of the home that was added, uh, I believe, after the fire that happened to this, in this home in the 80s or 90s, I believe it was. Uh, 1986, uh, in which there was a small roof structure added over the front entryway and a small uh, flagstone uh, planter. Um, it was acknowledged at the time that this project was uh, given its class one designation that those features, while they were not original, were complementary to the home and did not detract from its material integrity. The current owner with this particular proposal is looking to take that flagstone planter and modify it into a small fountain that will add interest at the entrance to the home. The findings that you need to be able to make in considering an alteration to a class one site begin on page five of your staff report, and there are a total of four findings. Uh, the first is that the proposed alteration does not significantly impact or materially impair the character defining features of the home, or that if there are impacts that the proposed alterations minimize those. The bottom of page five, you'll note what the character defining features are that were listed in the staff report as it went to the city council for its initial designation. We uh, have reviewed this and we assert that the proposed new landscape uh, and the replacement of the deteriorated concrete drives uh, in the new perimeter garden walls uh, enhance the home. They are uh, not affecting the character defining features of the site. And in fact, many of the overall configuration of the proposed site plan is similar in its layout to that of the original. The second finding to be made is that the proposed alteration will assist in restoring the historic resource to its original appearance or will aid in its preservation or enhancement. Here we find that the um, amount of trees and, um, and the additional uh, hardscape strengthen and again integrate the, um, the new casita, which is, I, I think is currently still under construction, and the swimming pool with the house and the outside features that are in the southern part of that um, backyard. So we believe that the proposed findings do conform with the second finding, or the proposed alterations do conform to the second finding. The third is that the uh, addition to the historic resources is consistent in terms of massing proportions, materials, and finishes to the existing resource that either can be distinguished from the, res from the existing resource or are indistinguishable but where those uh, are so such as indistinguishable, they would be recorded as a, in the archival file understanding that which was added currently and that which is the original. Um, there are no pr additions proposed to the uh, home itself as part of this project. The current landscape and hardscape, as noted in the staff report, bear little resemblance to the original design drawings. The proposed landscape and hardscape enhance the livability of the site. They replace a badly deteriorated asphalt driveway with a new concrete drive and generally are more reflective of the original site plan than what currently exists. Thus, we believe the project meets this finding. The last finding regard is regarding uh, whether there's a use of federal funds. There are none on this project, and so that finding does not apply. So in short, staff believes that this project does meet the findings for considering uh, approval of this particular request for alteration, and that the alteration is being done in a way that is sympathetic and harmonious with both the home and that which we see on the simple landscape site, or I'm sorry, uh, site plan that was part of the original drawings for the home. The homeowner is in the audience and is available to answer any questions you may have, and I'm available to answer any questions you may have as well. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to ask the board if there are questions of staff. Um, I do have one question. Okay. Uh, I know it says in the report on page five of seven. Jay, can you use that, your microphone um, a little closer? I'm sorry? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. It said uh, that uh, the existing colors of the house, uh, most likely not the original colors. Um, do we know what the original colors were? No, we don't. Okay. The color chip that you have in the back end of your report is as close to what I was able to get the printer to produce. So th this does show you what the colors are that are being proposed. This is basically the body of the house color, and this is the chocolate brown that most of the trim on the home has been painted. Okay, when, back when the house was designated uh, in 
2010. Do you recall, Ken, if there was any discussion about the original causes of the house and whether an attempt had been made to discover them? I was not uh, liaison to the board at that time, so I don't know what discussion took place with regard to color. Okay, good, thank you. And if I remember correctly, when this property came before us a few years ago, color was discussed at that time and those same facts came about. There was no really total reference, so they were doing their best to be in the spirit of the, the, the colors. Um, so any other questions of staff? So the action's now with the board. Your comments and questions, please. No further uh, questions or comments. Uh, in the case, uh, <clears throat> uh, I'd like to bring then the, um, I'd really like to come to the, um, to the mic, please. You could sign in and um, come to the mic, tell us your name. My name is Judy Hudgens, and I will sign in. Okay, now that I brought you up there, <laughs> <laughs> this is, does the board have any questions of, of, of the uh, applicant? And or is there anything particularly I'd like that you uh, would like to tell us about the house um, and about, about this particular project? We um, used an architect uh, uh, who is familiar with the area and he is, um, he was very adamant about trying to make this integrated into the area and the home. And I think he did a great job, and I'm proud of, of what we are submitting today. Um, I, I'd just like to comment here, too. I think that the landscaping on this particular home is one of the most special and all. I mean, it is, it's just, it's really, I mean, you're really looking at the landscaping and then, oh, there's the house. <laughs> and so the landscaping really is an integral part of the house. And so um, I just like to express my appreciation for your continuing to respect that because it really, really is important. And um, many um, people do not understand how important landscaping is, but it's obvious that that you that you do so. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you, okay. Mr. Chair. Yes. Uh, just a comment. Um, I like the selection of plants. I, I think he selected plants that will contribute to the environment, to the bees, to the butterflies, and to the birds in the area. And I, I think that's really important. Thank you. So I'm I appreciate that. Thank you. I'm starting a butterfly garden in the back too. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> I was going to suggest butterfly weed, but I know it's I have, messy. I already but have I three. love it. Good. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank We're you. Uh, yes. Um, I've not driven by the site uh, within the last month or so, but um, my recollection is that it was very overgrown. Mm -hmm. in some areas, and I guess the question is, have the major overgrowth been removed yet, or is it going to be? No, not yet. Okay. We were leaving them up to try to keep the dust down from all the construction that's going on. Okay. It's helped. It's amazingly dusty in the home, <laughs> yeah. but it's kept it from, the. It's, it's proved to be a barrier. So when this goes forward, then we will start the, um, the removal of the overgrowth. Great, and when this particular project is completed, um, will the house be somewhat more visible? Yes. Or it will? Oh, yes. Okay. That's yes, fantastic. it will. Okay, thank you so much. Sure. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for coming thank forward. You. Thank you. So any other questions then, board? May I have a motion to accept the recommendation by staff to allow the alterations? Move to approve as uh, recommended by staff with the alterations and the conditions listed in the report. Okay. I'll okay. second. <clears throat> so we have a, a first by Member Dixon and a second by Member Huff. Is there any further discussion? 
Seeing none, those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? The motion carries, six to zero. The next item is discussions, our discussions and 5A, and it's on the agenda is the symposium, and I guess that would be me. So I'm passing around now an updated um, program, uh, which I will share with you um, a few pieces of, infor uh, of information. Um, you can see we have very few um, blue highlights anymore, which is really good. That means that everything else coming along is being, being confirmed. Um, we will be having a staff meet, uh, a board uh, subcommittee meeting here very, very shortly. And at that meeting, we will now be getting into the details. So the fun part is kind of like, um, not, not behind us, but the real nitty gritties are about to begin with all the details to make this happen. Um, one comment I would like to also make is that um, I'm very grateful the staff is working on some handouts, which I think are gonna be right, very interesting. I don't, and when Mr. Lyon's ready to disclose what they are, um, I'm sure he will do so. Um, but I think these handouts are so important to have the information disseminated that are going to be on them um, at the um, at the a annual uh, event. Um, also, would just like to mention that if you be thinking about uh, nominations um, for the Certificate of Recognition Awards, we've narrowed that down to the uh, average of two a year. Um, I will, and I will ask again staff to submit prior awardees and guidelines um, for the um, for the board to review, and then we will be scheduling a time to have further discussion um, about this. So just sort of put on your thinking. And when you see what's been nominated or what's been um, awarded before, I think it will help you um, a, a great deal. So, um, are there any questions that you might have from the board at this point? about the program. Okay, um, yes. Just one, so the to be determined, the last uh, blue line here, it's going to be one of these properties? No, there will be, uh, we have five already um, confirmed and so there'll be five more. And these are just ideas that are under consideration for the other five. But I and I also, and the subcommittee will come up with even more. So these are ideas. Okay, so you have five tours yeah. that are currently yeah. the ones right above it. You yeah. see with a C. Right, right. Okay. and then your these are five to, that you're considering. Uh, other ideas, okay. right? And we will be adding to that, and we will welcome from the board. Do you have some? Yeah, under tours, where it says talk with Canyon. Can you elaborate on that and what, what that is? That actually will be conducted um, by the Agua Caliente uh, tribe. Okay. Um, and it's a tour that they would like that they would like to conduct and like to do. Good. So Kate Anderson uh, is going to be you know, taking the charge on, on yeah. that one. Wonderful. Right. Yes. Uh, okay, Linda, sir. one of the things that I want to try to do with the tours is to bring in as many of the properties that have been designated class one this mm -hmm. year as possible. And there've just been a few now at the last council meeting that have been designated. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna actually end up probably with more tours than we're going to need. And then we're gonna have to go through them and decide what we really should do. But if we can get the class one designations from this year as right. part of this tour mm -hmm. package, I think that that would be yeah. very, very meaningful. And one of the other things that I want to work on, since we are able to have our after party at the O'Donnell Club now, which is wonderful, I want to make sure that Stephen Keelan's there and I want him to bring 
other Palm Springs Preservation Foundation people like Jan Harper, who's a trustee of the club, mm -hmm. and others who are knowledgeable, and to have them have special name tags that, that people who, as they're having cocktails and stuff, can talk to these people about the historic resource that they're experiencing. Oh, I'm that, sure they'll that, do it. Yeah, I'm sure yeah. they will. But I want them to be identified, and I want to get as many of them on board as that as possible. So that's sort of looking forward the way I see that part of that working. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Dan will be in charge of the tours, which is really, uh, uh, I really it appreciate. Be, it would deal. be wonderful if this garden is done if, yeah. I mean, because that's yeah. class one, and then to see the landscaping. Right. It would. That may have to be next year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, um, and speaking of the O'Donnell Golf Club um, and PSP up again, it was Jan Harper that I went to to be able to twist her arm to be able to get that done. So uh, we really appreciate Jan and the PSP up doing this. And, and all of the organizations are contributing um, to the uh, event, uh, both with a uh, presentation and with a tour, and which I think is really showing the, uh, the wonderful support that we get here from all the organizations, extremely, extremely important. Okay, so that includes my uh, report. Staff, any other, um, <clears throat> nothing else? Okay, then we'll move right along to board comments. Board, any comments? I just have two things. Uh, they're really invitations. Um, first is um, on February 21st at the Annenberg Theater. Um, we are having an event um, for the new COD uh, Palm Springs campus. They have the architects coming to present their preliminary design concepts for the campus here. And uh, we'll also be representatives from Cal Poly Pomona and the COD discussing the Palm Springs School of Architecture. Um, this is a no charge event. And so I would really encourage um, board members to, we would love to have you to attend. That's at 1030. Uh, in the morning, and uh, you can go online to get the tickets, uh, and say you still register even though it is a no charge um, event. We'd love to have you there. Um, and um, also, um, one other event is um, that I am chairing is the birth of the cool. Um, and that's going to be, I think, a very fun um, experience. Um, Liz Armstrong, who was the former CEO of the, um, or the exec executive director of the museum, she um, wrote a book. And it really shows the interrelationship between architecture, art, music, particularly jazz, photography, filming, um, and design during that 50s and 60s era and how they influenced one another. So she has a panel that is going to be representing each of those different industries. So, um, and I'll just name one of them is a gentleman by the name of Peter Bart. And Peter is, um, was executive, um, was a, uh, uh, editor of Variety Magazine for 20 years and MGM executive vice president uh, in the 60s and in the 70s he uh, was at Paramount. So anyway, two events to invite you all to. When is it? It is February 22nd at 2 o'clock at the Cultural Center. And again, the registration is online for that one as well. Twenty first. Twenty first. Yeah. Ten thirty. Okay. Lesson of my comments. Yes. Um, comment and question. Um, I think my first 
thing is, uh, my question is, do we know what our top five priorities are for this season or this upcoming year of the board in terms of uh, nominating or designating properties? So that's one thing. And the second thing is, could we get an update on the racket club? Uh, yes, and uh, Member Nelson, I missed what was the first question that you asked. The first question was, what are the top five board priorities in terms of nominating or designating okay. properties? Uh, I don't know if that was discussed at the December meeting, but I wasn't present for that. Do you want to speak to that, or would you like me to? I would. Yeah, what? I, I, prefer, I prefer you to speak okay. to that. <laughs> um, so the top priority, and I, hopefully I can do these by memory, um, the uh, top priority was the Las Palmas Liquor Store building, mm -hmm. the corner of North Palm Canyon and Vista Chino. The second priority was uh, the Araby Adobe, uh, referred to as, I guess, um, okay. help me out, El Dumpo. El Dumpo. <laughs> I know it had a funny name. <laughs> the, th the third priority is uh, the Araby Rock Houses, uh, which is a collection of about five that were done by Lee Miller. Uh, the fourth, hmm. I knew my memory was going to fade precipitously on this one. Dick, can you help me on this one? Um, was it the bank? No, no, the bank wasn't that high, was it? I'll tell you what. What I'll do is yeah. I'll send out to you an email. That's a good idea. <laughs> I apologize. I was able to get through the first three, but I cannot okay. remember what the other ones and were. And I usually what? carry all that stuff with me, and I didn't today. <laughs> what did you say the first one was? The first one? The liquor the, store, the, Las Palmas Las, liquor store. Okay, that's what I thought. Yeah. yeah. Great. All right. Right. Thank you. And then update on the racket club? I'll do that during uh, board, during uh, staff comments. Okay. Right. Board? Okay. Then I will now move to staff comments. All right. <laughs> uh, so the... Um, we're currently going out for contracts for professional services for the uh, historic resources report on the Las Palmas uh, liquor store. Uh, we've also, uh, um, we're going out for contract f with a professional services firm to do a limited update on the Palm Springs Racquet Club. The last set of um, historic resources report that the board and the city council had considered, actually it never made it to city council, were those from the 2004 um, John Ash Group uh, report, and uh, you know the the site has sat there for a long time since then, in a very deteriorated state, and so we're going to be doing a limited update to the resources report, analyzing it under its current condition to determine whether the same uh, findings uh, can be made under the new ordinance and um, in its current condition. We don't know whether we'll have access to the site. Uh, by the owner. The owner has not communicated back with, with me oh, on nice. our request for access. So it may be that we'll be doing this as a um, observ observation from the public way. But we'll do our best to get this uh, analyzed in a more succinct way given its current condition and that will come back uh, to the um, board in a public hearing. Uh, on Can, other excuse me, I have a question. Could yeah. we, would it be appropriate, could a drone be utilized? Could a what? Could a drone be utilized? I don't know. Do you have one? <laughs> we'll get one. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do have the advantage of using Google Maps. So I think from an aerial perspective, we, we do have enough information that we can see the site in that regard. Okay. Thank you. Clever idea, though. <laughs> <laughs> I'm into drones right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, on other matters... If you uh, happen to watch the city council meeting this past week, the Wellwood Murray Library Courtyard, the council accepted a construction contract for that project, so that project will be going into construction in the very near future. And that is the, I guess, the final phase of a nearly 10-year <laughs> project to update and restore the Wellwood Murray Library. So a building that uh, certainly deserves... Um, all the TLC that it's gotten, and the courtyard will be, I think, a very positive final finishing touch to it. Um, mentioning the handouts that Dick was referring to, and uh, I guess we also have a new, um, a new um, member roster that I'm going to pass around to you.
And um, let me get these together here. Uh, the second one that I'm passing around, um, thank you, Eric, is the uh, uh, realtor's uh, information sheet that uh, Dick was referring to. Uh, we've had um, a very good interface with the realtors um, community through uh, Jim Franklin. And one of the things that they had asked for with the new ordinance is, couldn't we please have something that we could hand out to our clients that helps them ex understand how this historic preservation thing works in Palm Springs. So what we did was put together this two-page um, FAQ that uh, basically lays down the basics so that if you were a realtor or a uh, person looking at real estate in Palm Springs, this gives you sort of the entry primer to what is a class one, two, three, and four as well as how these buildings can be altered in the process that would one, one would take. So um, we've reviewed this with Jim Franklin, who's um, very pleased with the overall content of it. And uh, so we're going to be making this available both at the uh, booth at the Modernism Week show and uh, to realtors as we continue our outreach to, to that particular group in our community. Any questions on that? Hi. Go I have a question. Yeah. So how are you going to distribute? The, are, is each office, real estate office, going to get some of these to distribute within the office so we know that they're reaching agents? Right. They'll be able to get copies of this stuff. We'll either make it available through the city's website or we'll make it available in hard copy to the various realtors. What we've been doing for the past about year uh, with Jim Franklin's involvement is we've been sort of taking the show on the road. Uh -huh. and going into many of the different realtors' offices and just doing Q&A, uh, explaining to them how to get to the information on the city's website, what are the different new classifications, how can they review the Class three list to determine if a property that's listed is on that list or not. So we've been giving them basically a, a primer, if you will, um, through some of the on-site meetings that we've been attending, and we'll continue to do that, as well as to make these available through Jim to the uh, realtors' board so that they can distribute it to their members as far as they can spread them. Thank you. Also, uh, Ken, you have been visiting um, some homeowners associations and neighborhood associations, um, which I think is wonderful, and that's another opportunity for this kind of information to get out, because it's yes. good for the buyer and the seller, actually. Yes. Um, this is a case where I'm... I, I, I think where the city has really stepped up to the plate beautifully in where our board um, has worked with the Board of Realtors um, because they are such an integral part of making this all work. Um, I mean, that really is the beginning baseline on you know what's, what's really going to happen. It affects our future. So I really, really appreciate what, Ken, you're doing. And the city has taken this particular uh, component and really, really um, made it work. Well, and we'll continue to hone this and polish it as we need to to meet their respond their needs as well, so that their clients are as informed as possible. Right. Uh, on other matters, just wrapping up my comments, um, there will be the usual HSPB unmanned booth at the Modernism Show during Modernism Week, which is February 14th through the 17th. These brochures will be there. As I mentioned at the last meeting, um, our um, orange and blue uh, brochures, the orange brochures being those on historic site, and the blue brochures being on historic districts, are going to be, have been updated. Um, the graphic design is finished and will be going to print uh, later this week. Uh, so we'll have those as new mem new bleh, yeah. new pass out information uh, at the booth and at the front counter in the planning department. Um, we're working with the city. The city now has a GIS person uh, uh, in the IT department, and if any of you recall uh, from past. Um, exhibits that we've done at the Modernism Week booth, we've had kind of a multi-page map that helped people if they wanted to go out on a walking tour or a drive-around tour to see where the Class 1 and Class 2 sites are. 
Um, it's been a very clumsy document because it's a it's a real manual production, and so each time we get another document that, or another building that's been designated, the map becomes obsolete. So we're working with GIS to see if we can come up with a GIS-based map that we can use to replace that um, older handmade map. Um, and I'll know more about that as we go forward with GIS. I have a meeting with them later this week. Um, and markers, we have um, one marker that was recently installed at the American Legion building. We have four markers that are ready to be installed. I have three markers that are ready to be picked up from the uh, Palm Springs uh, promotions. We have two more orders that have recently been placed. That's for the O'Donnell Golf Course and the McQueen residence. And I have uh, three orders coming out of this past city council meeting um, that I'll need to develop and place those orders um, for those markers for the Douglas, Kramer, and Desert Holly nominations. So we're busy. These are being installed, as you know, as the facilities department has time to do so. Um, they've been pretty short-staffed and busy through the holidays, so I'm hoping we're going to be able to see a few more of these being installed in the next month or so. And that concludes my comments. So, Ken, if you could uh, just repeat again, if you were there, four that are ready and three to be picked up by facility management? Well, they're the, I have to pick them up from the, from the um, supplier. Oh, picked up from the supplier. Okay. And the other ones? I have two, or two that are orders that have been placed for the O'Donnell Golf Club and the McQueen residence, and then three that are yet to be ordered for Douglas, Kramer, and Desert Holly. Wow, this is, this is really good. I mean, this is... We're really plugging moving away. Up, really moving up the <laughs> ball from what we had before in terms of timing to get these things uh, going. And it is my understanding, too, that the um, now the goal is to try to have that plaque identifiable to the public from the, st from the street as much as possible, when it's possible. Um, well, yeah, if they're not if they're not visible from the public way, that's not right. much use in putting them up. <laughs> yeah, in other words, they're not being tucked away. Right. Yeah, when we work with the property owners to find the location to place them, we always stipulate that it has to be viewable from the public way. Right. There are some of the older markers where you actually have to walk onto the property and you know go around the corner and right. find it somewhere, and we try not to do them that way. Just right. just as a matter of you know private property rights and is, you know, keeping people viewing sure. things from the public way, it's safer that way. Right. Thank you. Yes. Mr. Anybody Chair, I have one thing that I would like to say. Um, back in December, my husband was sick, so I got to watch a city council meeting that was on a Thursday night, and it was the Inspiration Point Council oh. meeting. And I just would publicly like to thank Council Member Middleton for her words about let's do something in this community to save that piece of land so it's never mm -hmm. developed. I, I thought they were strong words, and I really appreciated her interest in not wanting to see that piece of property built upon. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to express that. Thank you very much. And I believe that the mayor kind of agreed with her and so hopefully um, in the future there'll be some sort of campaign to buy that property since the developer was very eager to sell it and it'll be a part of Palm Springs forever. Good, thank you. Uh, two comments. Um, so going back to Marcus, we noticed uh, during a site visit to the community church that there's no visible marker. And not sure if it ever had one, and if it did, what happened to it. So uh, just bringing that up again for staff to make a note of, um, because obviously it will need to be plaqued when the new project gets completed, because the whole definition of that site is changing. Yeah. Uh, secondly, on this document regarding real estate, I know this has been in the works for over 10 years, so uh, it's pretty amazing to finally see this come to fruition. My question is, uh, I know perhaps there were meetings with the local board of realtors, uh, and if there weren't, please correct me on that. What, what was your, I'm sorry, what was your question? 
with a meeting with the local pumping board of realtors? Uh, Jim has scheduled various meetings with some of the various offices, so yeah, we've gone into some of their meetings, yes. Okay, so the reason I asked is because I'm wondering if maybe there's a way that they can work with the state to make this an official addendum to the packet that people receive in their paperwork when they are buying a property that may be subject to, mm, you know, one of these classes, because it's one thing just to make a realtor aware of it, it's another thing is, is an official addendum that has to be in the actual paperwork that they're required to sign when they uh, open a square. That's a so great, that would be all. That's a great idea. Oh. So we're talking about I'll mention that to Jim and we'll see where that goes. Yeah, Good. that's a wonderful idea. Thank you. Okay, this is very good. So um, I think it's maybe time to announce an adjournment. Historic Preservation Board uh, will adjourn to its regularly scheduled meeting on Tuesday, February the 11th, 2020 at 9 a.m. in the large conference room at City Hall. I wish you all a very good week. <laughs>